गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स फर्स्ट थिंग फर्स्ट इज माई वॉइस आडिबल गुड मॉर्निंग सर इट्स आडिबल थैंक यू सी सॉरी फॉर बींग लेट फ्रॉम टूमार आई बी आर टाइम सी द थिंग इज yesterday i have been saying what is the advantage of psa or optional as such right and i have started saying uh, what are the pros and cons of this uh, subject and uh, i am discussing about the outline of the syllabus like in any paper there will be two types uh, section paper one paper two paper one contains two sections section a section b paper two contains two sections section a section b so the first thing that you people have to know is you have to know the parts of the syllabus very clearly what is the syllabus at any time you should be able to correlate uh, any news with the syllabus as well so i want you people to be thorough with the syllabus this is the first requirement what do i mean by being thorough with the syllabus i mean to say that you no need to by heart the syllabus try to understand the syllabus in a very sophisticated manner and in a very clear manner section a contains in paper 1 political theory in political theory there are 10 chapters chapter 9 10 is about thinkers 10 is about western thinkers 9 is indian thinkers 8 is ideologies based on these thinkers the rest of the topics are related to these things so the base for this lies at 9 10 and 8 and section a first chapter deals about just like any other subject as we are discussing political science political theory discusses about political theory what it is and how that can be uh, and the how the subject has evolved so this will be first chapter then from 2 3 4 5 6 7 they are the themes in political theory like just is democracy power right so those are the things So I said the base is nine and ten, particularly ten, because political science is of Western origin. Hence, Western thinkers are very important to remember. So you have to start at ten. This is section A, paper one. Section B contains Indian government and politics, IGP. Here again, how to remember the syllabus? Three ways. One way is national movement and constitution formation. the second one is core constitutional philosophies how the constitution has given the structure for the country the three tier administration right so this is about that and the last one is about politics and political developments in the country so this is section b so today i am going to start i have also discussed about the books that you have to refer the basic book that you can start with is tamil nadu administrative book then slowly you can enhance your understanding of the subject further what i said is i said or uh, today i am going to discuss about paper 2 in that again there will be two sections section a section b try to remember the syllabus very very clearly this is the first requirement of you people before starting any subject your preparation has to be in such a way that you have to start with the basics syllabus you have to understand the syllabus you should understand the previous year questions on every topic then you have to start preparation so what i want my students who want to get 330 i want you people to get 330 in optional that is my target if you want to get 330 in this paper the most important thing is first thing is you have to know the syllabus you people have to be able to say what component of syllabus is attached to this second thing is what are the previous year questions in each and every topic and how they are getting oriented these are the two requirements that you, i want from you right always focus on that that is the reason why i shared the syllabus copy <coughs> in the group you can take a xerox of it and then you can start looking at that no need to by heart try to analyze the things try to analyze right that is the second component this is about what are the pros and cons already i have discussed yesterday this is political theory this is the subject it gives the overall introduction of what is political science what is political theory then what are the various approaches to it theories of state uh, justice equality rights democracy 
power these things are about the so called aspects of political theory political ideologies are based on three points indian political thought and western political thought that is what they but this is how the syllabus is oriented you can start it here i'll share today this book and why i ask you to remember the syllabus some previous year questions is whenever you are reading this paper you should be in a position to understand which aspect should i touch which aspect i should leave as far as political science is concerned right so in the hindu whenever you are reading you should know where are the questions that are being picked up from and what are the areas that we have to push up right for that i want you to prepare the syllabus analyze the syllabus analyze previous year questions and every topic these are the books i said and you have good books are a bit advanced books you can read them in the last <coughs> but this book contains the entire chapters particularly up to ideology it will contain chapter 1 to 8 this theory contains the political aspects such as democracy rights power justice equality so they contain uh, rajiv bhargava and ashok acharya has given very clearly those chapters i don't want you to read the entire book i'll share the entire book but i'll share i'll also share the concepts that you have to read in this after understanding the concept if you are reading this just like uh, a novel it will help you for indian political thought chapter 9 this is the book that you have to refer uh, the old version is this the new version is this right so you can refer any book both of equally good for western political thought 50 major political thinkers See why I have given this is no need to read the book as such, but when you look at the index page of these books, you will remember the political thinkers. See optional, any optional, in order to score highest mark, you have to know the thinkers. You have to know the names of the persons who has propounded the theories. And what is the difficulty in remembering these names? First difficulty is. humanity subject we are very new to humanity subject in what sense in the sense that our under graduation after our uh, 10th class after our 10th the templates to as well as your under graduation or post graduation that will be not in humanities many 90% of the students are not from humanities as a result remembering these names thinkers names is very difficult that is background that we have the second one is the names of these thinkers are western thinkers as a result in order to remember these western scholars names it is very difficult if it is indian scholar we'll always remember right charakya uh, uh emen roy gandhi because we have been hearing those names right from our school days as a result remembering those names is not a bit difficult thing but remembering the western scholar names is very very difficult the reason is this because we have not heard about them the new names appear to be uh, this is for the first time that we are listening to the names so when you open these type of books the index page itself they will give you a list of thinkers so you should take a xerox of that list of thinkers attach it and always see who are the thinkers who are the thinkers that is the thing political theory and introduction this speaks about chapter 1 and it also gives reflections on other chapters also so in the end you can read this book <coughs> indian government of politics i said three things indian movement in the political perspective making of constitution up to this you can classify this as part 1 then 3 4 5 6 7 all these are constitutional features of indian constitution so for this you should know the bear act for that i ask you to refer pm bakshi not small one a big one because their case studies will be clear supreme court cases will be very clear in that right for these books indian nationalism up to this you have the books of such as indian history making you can read bipin chandra book if you want to start india's struggle for independence in the introduction itself they give what is their approach to understand indian nationalism right 
Next one is planning and economic development, caste, religion, ethnicity. This is all about party politics in the country. For that, you can refer to Oxford book, which is very good one, or you can refer to other books that I have showed you. As far as the current affairs is considered, again, the Hindu is very important for this. And this Frontline magazine is a very good magazine because the terminology that they give, the analysis that they give on the politics front, it will be clearly uh, very good. As a result, we can refer to them. And for any source, our class notes is the, this is class notes. Lines. Our class notes is most important thing. This is what I am speaking about. P.M. Bakshi for Indian Constitution, in order to understand the politics, it is very clearly given in Swadiya Padiya. In order to understand the constitutional debates, Subhas Kashyap book is very good. In order to understand governance, Akshmikan book is also good. This is the book that I was speaking, in order to get comprehensive insights, particularly about the role of caste, role of religion in Indian politics. Neeraj Gopal and Pratap Baru Mehta has given this, so very good book again. This is Andrew Haywood book. You can use at a referendum or refer to refer anything after reading everything. If you want interested to read further, you can read this book. You can read this book. And this is B. N. Fodia. What are the most, most important things that you have to study in that book? So, today I am going to discuss about paper two, comparative politics and international relations. Guys, what I wanted to say is, again, just like any other paper, this paper too has two things. Comparative politics and international politics. Comparative politics. When we come to this term, you have to understand what is this comparative politics, what is this international relations. Comparative politics is comparing the domestic policies of each and every country. India has its own constitution, Pakistan has its own constitution, right? China has its own constitution, Japan has its own constitution, USA has its own constitution. In comparative politics, what you do is, you study the domestic politics of a particular state and you are going to, you are going to analyze that, you are going to compare that domestic politics with other countries, right? Now the question is, whenever we are reading comparative politics, I said it is domestic politics of a state, of a state, domestic politics of this, domestic politics of that individually, and then we will be comparing. Again, comparative politics is a very old subject because comparative politics for the first time, it was done by Aristotle way back in 3rd century BC, right? Now, the challenge for the students will be, sir, you are saying that it is comparative politics. We have to study about the politics of each and every state and then we have to compare. There are almost 200 nation states in the world now. How to remember each and every state politics? For that, they know this. Thus, if you are going to study in that way, it is going to become difficult. As a result, UPSC itself has given one thing. They have classified all the states into three categories. One category is advanced states. The second one is developing countries or least developed countries. So three classifications. So most probably in political science, only two classifications are there. One is the so-called developed countries or the advanced countries, how they conduct their politics and the less developed countries or the developing countries or least developed countries. All this will be classified into another block. In politics, in political science, you compare or you call the developed countries as global north countries and the countries which are least developed, we call it, consider that as global south countries, right? So just we'll analyze how the politics was there in the global developed countries and developing countries and then we start comparing. So that is how the syllabus is framed. So one thing that you have to understand is comparative politics means politics of internet, internal uh, domestic politics and you have to compare it with other countries. That is a thing. So this is comparative politics and international relations is a particular country's foreign domain. This is domestic politics. Comparative politics is domestic politics. International relations is the foreign relations of these countries. Foreign relations of these countries. How they are conducting their foreign policies. 
So when we study that, then that becomes international relations. Again, let me make it very clear. This subject is again, it appears to be very vast. But if you know what is the technique or how UPSC has framed the syllabus, then it appears to be very easy to remember. Look at chapter one, chapter two, chapter three and chapter four. These four chapters in section B, section A of paper two, these four chapters, the first four chapters are the only chapters which are dealing with comparative politics. One, two, three, four. Only four chapters are dealing with comparative politics. Look at this. Comparative politics, just like political theory in section A, chapter one. Political theory, it's meaning, right? What is political science? That will be explained there. Similarly, what is comparative politics? What is their nature? What is their major approach? So as it is a very theoretical subject, they say how the field has evolved, what is it, right? So how you compare nation, political, economic approach, political, sociological approach. So in this way, you are going to compare the countries. What is the limitations of comparative method? Now, this is the theory part of comparative politics. Now, what they do is they compare, they start comparing. What they start comparing, comparing the state in comparative politics. Characteristics and changing nature of state in capitalistic and socialistic economies. They are comparing two countries or two states, capitalistic states and socialistic states, industrial states, developing societies. This is what I said. One thing is on the capitalism and socialism lines. The second one is advanced countries and developing societies. So they are comparing state here. Next, they are comparing the politics of those countries, political parties in developed countries and developing countries, pressure groups in developed countries and developing societies, social movements in developed countries and developing countries. So again, in second chapter, they are comparing state. In third chapter, they are comparing the domestic politics, which includes political parties, pressure groups, social movements. They are comparing in two domains industrial and advanced that is industrial advanced countries and developing societies not only this the fourth chapter is comparing globalization what is the impact of globalization on the developed countries and developing societies so these are the four chapters that they are comparing so very easy to remember the syllabus paper two is about comparative politics and international relations comparative politics the first four chapters deals with comparative politics the first chapter in that deals with what is comparative politics, how the subject has evolved, what are the various ways to compare two states and then they give what are the limitations of comparative politics. Next one is two, three, four is about what they are comparing as such. In chapter two, they are comparing states. In chapter three, they are comparing politics. In chapter four, they are comparing globalization impact. So very simple to remember, right? So this is the only thing. So comparative politics, only four chapters in the entire paper. The rest of the chapter, the rest of paper two is international politics. The rest of the chapters, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and even section B is also a uh, continuation of in international relations. So your international relations doesn't start with section B. It starts with chapter five in section A itself. That you have to understand very clearly. Again, just like any other subject, in international relations also, you have to study the theories, theories, approaches to study of international relations, how idealists go with international relations, how realists speak about international relations, how Marxists speak about international relations, how functionalists speak about international relations, how systems theory speaks about international relations and make sure this is in the international perspective, international perspective. In the first chapter also, in paper one also, there is some thinkers or ideologies that is speaking about political theory. This is speaking about international relations. So the scholars change, few scholars change, but the ideology is same. Idealism, realism, idealism in paper one is different, idealism in paper two is different. In what sense? In the scholars who has proposed it, right? That is the thing. But again, as in paper one, section A, the entire section A is dependent on chapter 10, chapter 9, and chapter 8. Your 5, 6, paper 2, 
from chapter 5 to section B, entire thing is dependent on this one. Once you understand approaches to the study of international relations, then we can understand international relations very, very clearly. So, the first basis is this one. Next one is, you have to understand some concepts in international relations. National interest, national security, national power, balance of power, deterrence, transnational actors, collective security, world capitalist and globalization. This is the second thing that you have to understand. So that I call it as the basics of international relations. What is the basics? One is knowing the theories, how to study or how to approach for international relations. The second one is knowing the concepts of international relations. These are the basics. The rest of the things are application of the basics, application of the basics. The rest of entire paper is application. Look at this. Chapter 7 speaks about international political order. After World War II, it starts. Rise of superpowers, non-alignment movement, collapse of Soviet Union. This is political dimension after Second World War. This is economical dimension after Second World War. From Bretton Woods to WTO, socialistic economies and the CMEA, third world demand for new international economic order, globalization of the world economy. All these are the political developments and economic developments post Second World War. The United Nations organization is a political entity after Second World War. And then regionalization of world politics. And then you have contemporary global concerns. Very simple to remember. Why it is very simple? It is again going in a, a, a unique framework. Understand the framework and analyze that. What is that? After Second World War, what happens? They wanted to establish a peaceful world. In order to establish a peaceful world, what is the most important thing? Why nations go for war? When there is no platform for discussion, they go for war. As a result, create some platforms for discussion. This is the major output. So what they started creating platforms on the political front, they started creating platforms on the economical side, they have started creating platforms on the political side. One platform is UNO, United Nations Organization on the economic front. This is the Bretton Woods institution, such as the World Bank, IMF. They are the Bretton Woods institutions. They created a platform for discussion, right? So this is about post Second World War and again, Whenever I say it is a post Second World War, it is a very new domain, very easy to understand, very limited subject. Because post Second World War, it is just like during the times of independence, Second World War has ended. As a result, the subject limitation is very, very less. Right? So, changing international political, what happened uh, in the world after Second World War that you have to study at the global level? These are the things that are taking place. Not only at the global level, even at the regional level, some organizations have been formed after Second World War. You have to read about that. This is static. This is uh, the concepts after Second World War. Now, after 2000, something has come and that is called the contemporary global concerns. The recent new millennium concerns. Democracy, human rights, environment, gender justice, terrorism nuclear proliferation right guys join with the same link that i have shared from today onwards you can use the same link for joining again and again right if it gets snapped off join again by using the same link so this is about contemporary global concerns how uh, uh, these things are challenged 